Have you ever wondered how a video like the one that you're watching right now, how that gets to your phone? Like how does the internet actually work? Uh, these are questions that I've had myself and in this video I thought I'd show you exactly how all of this works. Okay, so the answer to the question of how the video travels from wherever it is to your phone is electromagnetic waves. But before talking about exactly what these waves are, let's go into the concept of actually how the signal is transferred. So the signal is essentially the information of the video that you want to see in your phone. And the information there is just the pixels, the color of the pixels, the positioning of the pixels, the audio, the whatever else is transferred. How is that data actually transferred? Any computer or digital device communicates using binary numbers. And this means that for any such device, there exists only two things, ones and zeros. And binary is pretty much like a light switch. It's either on or off. And that's very similar to how Morse code actually works. So with Morse code, you have the long and the short signal, depending on if it's a long signal or short signal and the combination of the two, you can actually come up with a very nuanced language, uh, which is the same as the ones and zeros in binary. For example, in Morse code, SOS will be three short signals followed by a pause and followed by then three long signals and then another pause and then three short signals again. Thus, three short signals is an S and three long signals is an O. And the concept of Morse code is the same that we use for wireless connections, but instead we use electromagnetic waves as the medium. So now what are these electromagnetic waves? Electromagnetic waves? Uh, they are, to the common person, they would be things like the radio waves, uh, UV light, visible light, microwaves, uh, X-rays and other things. To a physicist, these things are all the same thing, namely electromagnetic waves. What decides the type of wave is the wavelength of the electromagnetic wave. So how long it takes the wave to oscillate up and down. Now it turns out that the human eye is sensitive to wavelengths between 400 nanometers blue light and 700 nanometers red light. And since the light that we humans can see falls within a very specific range of electromagnetic light, we call this light visible light. Makes sense. And there are also lights that we humans can't see, but other animals, like birds for instance, they can see UV light, uh, which I think is pretty cool. Same as the radio waves and microwaves are just electromagnetic waves with a wavelength of a thousand kilometers to one millimeter, where the shorter wavelengths are microwaves. And at the end of the day, all these waves are just electromagnetic waves, and this is exactly what wireless networks use. It doesn't matter if it's Wi-Fi, 3G, 4G, 5G, or simple old school wireless phone calls. And so what actually differentiates these different technologies is the specific wavelengths that they use or range of wavelengths that they use, and also what protocol that they use to encode the ones and zeros into the electromagnetic waves. Overall, the more modern 4G and 5G mobile networks use waves with smaller wavelengths. For example, 4G has a wavelength of a few centimeters, but the newer 5G has wavelengths of a few millimeters, which is why 5G is faster than 4G. And this then really helps us understand why this new technology is so much faster, because the smaller the wavelength, the more ones and zeros you can fit in the same space, and the more ones and zeros you can fit, the more data, and thus the more bandwidth. The downside is, however, that it's also a lot easier to block the lower wavelengths and therefore the usable range is a little bit shorter. So now we've talked a lot about how wireless works, but what about cables? While fiber optic cables are not much different in terms of its medium, it's a light signal, but light is also just electromagnetic waves. There are, however, some really big differences and one of them being that the signal is actually confined inside the cable. And since we use light as the medium for transmitting this information within the cables, uh, light also has a way shorter wavelength than the type of uh, electromagnetic waves used in wireless technology, which means that the bandwidth can be a lot higher. And there's also nothing really to block the signal within the actual cable except impurities within the glass fiber. So that means that you can actually run them really, really far and <laughs> across the world essentially, and still maintain a really superb connection. Fiber optic cables are, however, not what most common people have in their home. You will usually actually have copper-based cables because they're a lot more practical. Copper cables are also reliable and easy to use, and they can actually carry a decent signal across long distances, but they are physically more limited than fiber cables. 
This comes from the fact that in a copper wire, the signal is electrical and this creates a magnetic field which causes interference and this deteriorates the signal and thus limits the range. And this is not a problem for fiber cables as it uses the optical laser signal that doesn't generate a magnetic field. And fun fact, 99% of these cables travel under the ocean, which is kind of crazy to think about. This is, however, only the physical part of the story, but we also have the technical part of the story. So how does the data of a video, for instance, get packaged within the application of YouTube and then get sent to your phone? And also, how do we figure out where to send it? How does YouTube know to send the video that you want to watch to your phone? In many ways, the internet works just like a super advanced postal system, and we can break the situation down to the user and the network of servers we would like to access. To be more detailed in the discussion, we need to take a look at the internet protocol stack. So let's say that you want to write a message using your favorite messenger. You write your message and then you hit send, but what happens after you hit send? The details are specific to the application, but it works something like this. First off, at the application layer, your favorite app packages your message. This is like putting your letter in an envelope. And then secondly, the given application chooses an appropriate transport protocol, just like you must choose which postal service you should send your letter with. And then thirdly, at the network layer, we add the IP address of the sender and receiver, just like you must have a sender and receiver address on your letter. And then we have the link layer, which contains the mechanism of moving the message across the internet. And this is similar to figuring out the logistics of getting the letter from the post box, then to sorting, shipping, and so on. And at some point, the letter is then delivered. And then lastly, we have the physical layer of who is actually transporting your message. And as we discussed, this could be using a cable or Wi-Fi. And for a letter, this would be the postman and the transport vehicle, like a bike, car, truck, airplane, those sort of things. And this is then what's generally referred to as the five layer internet protocol stack. It doesn't really matter if you're sending messages or accessing website. The story is very similar, but some of the protocols used will change a little bit. And if you think learning about this stuff is as interesting as I do, then I think you'll really enjoy today's video sponsor, which is brilliant.org. So I really love doing this stuff, even if I know nothing about it. And I just really like figuring these things out and learning as I go. And another thing that I've started learning about lately is neural networks. And this is something that I really want to be able to understand at a more deep level. And I've been going through this really great course on brilliant.org that teaches you neural networks and how it all works. Brilliant is a long-term partner for this channel because I really like what they're doing and what they stand for. In addition to computer science, they're also the best platform that I've found for teaching maths and science in general. They have courses that will teach you everything from how to code with Python to neural networks to scientific thinking and basically teaching you how to use first principles to break down problems in visual and hands-on ways. I really can't recommend Brilliant enough and I'm proud to have them as a sponsor for this channel. And thanks to our collaboration, you get a seven day free trial of Brilliant Premium to try out. And once you've done that and tried it out and realized that you like it as much as I do, you'll also be able to get a 20% discount on an entire year of Brilliant Premium. So go check it out at the link in the video description. Now, the next part to this is routers and routers I would compare to postal offices around the world or postal hubs around the world. Essentially what happens is that the signal or the data travels to these different routers across the world in as straight of a line as possible to your actual computer. Uh, similar to how postal hubs, when you send a letter, it actually travels through the different hubs uh, in different countries until it gets to you and it tries to go in the straightest line possible. Sometimes these lines do not make sense, but that's generally the concept. But that still doesn't really answer the full question because then how do the routers actually figure out where the servers are that host the information that we're looking for? So how do the routers actually figure out the route? So before using the protocols discussed to send stuff, the browser will first have to learn where the website is located. This is similar to looking in a phone book and this is called a DNS lookup. And what happens is that a local DNS server will chop up the URL and start figuring out the IP address of the website. First, it will ask where to look for the addresses ending with a .com and then where to look for the website something.com. And finally, it will be directed to the server with the IP address for the website. 
the DNS server then hands the IP address back to the browser and your browser will ask for the website and load it for you. So as you might be able to tell, looking up or accessing a website or watching a video like this one is actually a fairly complicated process, but a computer can actually do a DNS lookup within seconds. So it's something that happens behind the scenes without actually bothering the user. So yeah, this was a lot of information, but I hope that you enjoyed it and that you got some information out of it and that you were actually able to understand how the internet works. My goal with this video was for you to then be able to just watch it and then if someone brings this up at a dinner party or like when you hang out with friends or something like that then you'll be able to actually explain how the internet works in some detail uh, and you'll also have the understanding for yourself i thought it was really interesting looking this stuff up and learning about it so uh, i hope you did too and yeah that's it for this one i hope you enjoyed it and i hope i'll see you in the next one